هلا بالخميس هلا 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 بالخميس هلا بالخميس هلا 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 بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة لا يوم الدين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So I am looking into the right camera, inshallah. So it's not Thursday night; it's actually Tuesday night, but it will be be premiering on Thursday evening, inshallah. So you'll be watching this on Thursday 8 p.m., but it's actually Tuesday 10 p.m. We just had dinner. We chatted about an hour almost before we started. But that's enough from me, inshallah ta'ala. I'd like to uh, hand over to my man, Rahman Asad, inshallah. This is a collaboration between the Ilm Hub and the Asad Cubs podcast this evening, inshallah ta'ala. And then on the far end. Guys. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm well. Alhamdulillah, I'm complaining. Mashallah, Sheikh, we really welcome you and we're really happy to have you here today. It's actually an honor for us to have you sitting amongst us. We've been watching you for too long. So we actually yearn to have you in our gathering. It's a pleasure to be here. We would really love, really love to hear some beautiful recitations, a few opening verses before we start officially with our program. Allah, I'm very happy. طيب إن شاء الله <تصفيق> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم واخشوا يوما واخشوا يوما لا يجزي والد عن ولده ولا مولود ولا مولود هو جاز عن والده شيئا إن وعد الله حق فلا تغرنكم الحياة الدنيا ولا يغرنكم بالله الغرور إن الله عنده علم الساعة وينزل الغيث وينزل الغيث ويعلم ما في الأرحام وما تدري نفس ماذا تكسب غدا وما تدري نفس بأي أرض تموت إن الله عليم خبير ما شاء الله خير ما شاء الله Rahman, you went straight for the kill without mm. introducing. <laughs> Subhanallah, that, that beautiful recitation just wow. penetrated the heart. Allah Every time Allah. I hear this, Sheikh, Subhanallah, it just brings exactly. tears to Allah. 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 Yeah. Allah bless me and reward him abundantly. Sheikh yeah. Yahya Rabi to introduce him. I just felt like we first needed that beautiful recitation. Set the tone, set the tone. Set the tone, yeah, before we could introduce him. Sheikh Yahya Rabi is all the way from the United Kingdom. And he's a scholar that side. He's been spreading the Dawah I'm, I'm, for I'm, many years. I'm, I'm no scholar. Yes, he's yes. spreading the Dawah for many years. I'm no scholar. And subhanAllah, we're honored to have him here this uh, evening. Allah Shaykh, and welcome. Zakam, Allah Khair. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor. I'm currently loving my stay here in South Africa, specifically Cape Town. And I have been given the best karak I've tasted in South Africa. Jazakallah khair. Allah yabarakhi. Sheikh, so, um, I mean, the social media is a buzz. You know, everybody knows Sheikh Yahya Rabi. La, la, no, uh, I'm scared. Ustaz Yahya, whatever title you choose for yourself, people sometimes think the Sheikh title is a bit too heavy or whatever, but whatever you're comfortable with, Sheikh. But um, who is Sheikh Yahya Rabi? 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يعني you asking a question that doesn't have a good answer because يحيى راضي سست سليم of الله تبارك وتعالى هو الله تبارك وتعالى has concealed a lot of his faults what we see on social media is الله تبارك وتعالى from his mercy and his blessings and his favors upon us that he conceals our faults and he shows to the people perhaps the good perhaps in order to benefit those people and to draw them closer to him and we ask Allah to accept our deeds from us and to grant us sincerity in our statements and actions but I'm just a normal person who just lives in the UK okay. in London and uh, that's where I grew up sure. so I was born in actually I wasn't born in the UK I was born in Denmark yeah. and I left Denmark when I was five years old and my family they migrated to um, the UK London so I grew up in London um, and uh, most of my education I've had there alhamdulillah rabbil alameen and uh, yeah so just an ordinary person in a podcast I watched that you were discussing with uh, brother John Fontaine uh-huh, right about yes. the teacher that um, helped yes. you with your with your English when you were little oh yes what were you speaking when you got to to the UK that's an interesting question <laughs> so when I got to the UK I didn't know a word of English of course I came from Denmark in Denmark they speak Danish so at home we speak Somali of course okay. mm. and uh, when I went to school or outside I was speaking Danish so when I came to UK my parents they had a very strict rule which is that at home we were only allowed to speak Somali we were not allowed to speak any other foreign language we would get in trouble if we did if we spoke any other language yes. therefore yani, alhamdulillah i learned a lot of people preserved, think, it's preserved. Preserved you can't I'm, speak they think you can't a lot speak of people think i can't speak somali <laughs> and i'm not going to speak somali for them <laughs> because they have to pay to hear me speak somali yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the things of the the conference at the end we might we might see inshallah but uh so at home we spoke somali and outside i was speak danish so when we came to uk of course i didn't know english i started primary school and uh, because i didn't know english so we had um, an assistant teacher who, who used to take me out of class and should be teaching me english so i remember she used to have um, a table of pictures a chart and she would point at different things like i remember the first day was vegetables mm-hmm. so she'd be pointing at the vegetables and saying what they what their names are in english and i would have to repeat after her and pronounce it like her Mm. Right, so things, I remember she was po- the clear accent. Yes, yeah, so that's she used to speak the way I speak now. This is this the, she caused this problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> she caused this problem. So what happened was she pointed at I remember a cucumber. She said, "This is a cucumber. Say cucumber." I'm Somali, so I said cucumber. <laughs> uh, Somali yeah. And then she said, "No, you have to say cucumber." Yeah. And I said cucumber, and she wouldn't move on oh, until I said it like her. Yeah. Mm. So, and then she did it for the number of things. And the, in the end, she said to me, what's your name? And I said, Yahya Rabi. She said, no, 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 no. Your name is Yahya Rabi. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I will accept you telling me how to pronounce the English, but, but don't interfere with my name. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's how this act yeah. came about. And because uh, a lot of people, they ask me, because some people who are from my area in London, mm-hmm. they say, you know, you are from West London and we've met a lot of people from West London. And they don't speak like the you. Why do you, why around. do you speak like that? And I tell them, well, like, it's, it's a long Bosh. story. <laughs> but in short, I was taught tajweed of English. <laughs> do you have you adopted any of our methods in your teaching of Arabic? Um, to be honest, yes, we have, of course. So because uh, it was very useful, her method was quite useful as well. So when we were when I was teaching Arabic. I used to teach Arabic with, you know, we used to have some uh, sessions in classes called muhadatha mm-hmm. for speaking. So in those speaking sessions, we used to focus on making sure that the students are able to speak clearly with and, and structure sentences well whilst they're speaking and also make sure that their pronunciation is very clear, right? So of course, I mean, most students who used to study with us, they would learn the tajweed of the Quran, therefore mm-hmm. their makharid and sifat would be good anyway. But you have certain students who haven't studied that, therefore, mm-hmm. you know, they will struggle. So you'd have to make sure that, I used to be the, perhaps the strict one, I'll tell them, listen, okay, I'm not going to let you speak Arabic like a foreigner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. if you're going to speak Arabic, speak it properly, yes. or we're going to be stuck here for a while. <laughs> right? Like I was stuck with English for mm-hmm. a long time. So Alhamdulillah, yeah, it, 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 it works. Alhamdulillah. No, Rabbi, Sheikh, we noticed that a lot of people believe that they don't go out of the country and they don't go to Egypt or outside countries like um, the Arabian countries they won't be able to speak the language I know that the conversation like you said you have the muhadatha mm. like what would you advise such people that can't really go out of the country 
but would really love to learn the language and I'm sure you've been teaching the Arabic language for many years. Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. I learned English, uh, I'm sorry, not, I learned English and Arabic in England. Right? Inshallah, inshallah. So I did learn English and Arabic as well. I learned it in London. I never traveled abroad to learn Arabic. And I don't think that my case is uh, special. I don't think that it, it makes me special for learning um, in, in Arabic in, in London. I think it was the, the thing that really helped me, motivated me to learn Arabic. It was that I had that drive and that love mm. and that passion. And I think that once you find that love and that passion for anything, you can learn it wherever mm. you are, mm. right? So that motivation, that drive that pushes you and motivates you to learn, it will make you do anything you need to do in mm. order to learn it. So I remember Arabic wasn't easy for me to learn. I actually found it very difficult. And my teachers, they can attest to that. Right? I used to be the shy kid who never used to like to speak, who was very shy to ask questions, uh, was very shy in terms of making mistakes and so on. So I used to literally shy away. And I remember my Sheikh, Sheikh Mahmoud, may Allah Azza bless him and preserve him. Uh, he would give me a hard time. He would say to me, listen, because we used to have in our classes, I remember when learning Arabic, we used to have sessions where we would be only dedicated to speaking. And that was a session that I hated the most. Because that would mean that I have to get out of my shell and I have to actually interact with people yeah. and, and speak. And I hated it. So I remember we used to do sometimes some way, something we call the hot seat. Mm. So you have to sit in front of the class and people throwing, be throwing questions at you. And you have to answer quickly, right? Mm. You have to think of answer quickly and respond. I hated that <laughs> because <laughs> I'm in front of everyone. I first of all wasn't used to standing in front of people and speaking in front mm. of people. And then secondly, in a foreign language, like, wow. Like you're asking me to do too much. It was, mm. it was for me. And then sometimes we have like team exercises where we do debates and so on. So the Sheikh, he would, he would always see me not interacting as much and not engaging and not putting in much effort due to my shyness and so on. Mm. And he kept telling me that I know you have the ability to do so. You have the potential. And he kept pushing me and he kept pushing me and he forced me and he put me in the spot. Until eventually I came out of my shell and Alhamdulillah it worked. I, it worked. I'm actually glad at the time I hated it, but I'm actually glad he did it yes, because you know sometimes you may dislike something at the time, but it's, mm. there's a lot of khair in it for mm. you. Like Allah says in the Quran, mm. right? You may dislike something, but perhaps it's good for you. So I came out of my shell, and it wasn't only that. After I, f I finished the academy, the institute, I finished uh, studying, then I graduated. During the final year, or the last two years, roughly, you could say, or the year and a half of uh, the institute. The, our mashayikh they made us teach start teaching and this was another challenge itself because now you have to stand in front of students mm. and you have to address them and you have to teach them and you have to know make sure you know what you're talking about so i was like there's no way i can do this it's impossible i could barely speak in front of my class you're asking me to go to complete strangers and speak to them mm. no way but they forced us and it was part of the curriculum that we had to do it Absolutely. and i believe that that's one of the greatest blessings that allah granted me in terms of yani, prepare me for even the da'wah and everything mm. because there's so many skills you learn from teaching and you know you have to be quick on your feet you have mm. to be able to you have to learn yeah. exactly <laughs> people are going to be throwing questions at you all the time right uh, really you have right. to be quick on your feet yeah. and subhanallah i actually believe that i learned a lot more teaching, teaching than when definitely. i was a student no, a lot okay. more A lot of things that didn't make sense to me When I was a mm. student Made sense to me when I was a teacher Because right? mm. I have to explain it to people So now I have to understand it properly yeah. right? so Of course and when you're teaching as well You have to do a lot of research You're preparing your lessons And all that stuff So I, I actually my subjects I managed to learn them a lot better When I was teaching them Than perhaps when I was a student And alhamdulillah yani, That was the, the journey So what, one thing that I say to people When it comes to learning any language And Arabic is no exception Is that you have to immerse yourself In that mm. language what I used to do was I used to only go to Arabic classes Saturdays and Sundays The rest of the week I have no classes So what did I used to do? I used to li listen to only Arabic Watch only Arabic videos Literally my YouTube for all that time was just Arabic There's, the, there's a, a, a Saudi channel That I used to watch on YouTube It's called Qanat al-Majd mm, yes. Qanat al-Majd I used to watch follow it like religiously, <laughs> right? Mm. I used to watch everything on there. I was aware of all their programs and so on. And just being exposed to that Arabic, constantly hearing it and always watching it, it gave me, you know, some knowledge that I picked up naturally without mm. even knowing. Yeah. So when I'd go to my classes, it's like a lot of the things that were said and so on, I was always, I was already familiar with. Right? Mm. So that helps So I kind of created for myself Like an Arabic environment yeah. Where I was constantly hearing it Reading it You know Trying to speak it And, and because we were being forced To speak it as well You know Some of my classmates Will practice with each other If I saw some people Speak Arabic in the masjid I'll try to speak to them in Arabic mm. And so on And it helped a lot Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh So Ustad from, We gather from this Hello. That your journey of knowledge Started at a very young age 
I know yes. in the in the Somali community that yes. Quran is memorized at the very tender age, right? Sahih. So when you just start memorizing Quran and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Now, so I started memorizing the Book of Allah wa Taala from the age of roughly five years old, and that's typical the Somali household where you know your parents they take you to what they call duksi. Right. Duxia, which is, yeah, which is the maktab, right? It's the maktab, the Somali version of maktab. Duxia, 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 they call it. Or some people call it malamat, depending mm. where you come from in Somalia. So I was taken to Duxi when I was like five years old. However, my mother, she would take me there, but I had no interest in memorizing Quran. I was only going there because my mom was taking me there. Mm. Right? I had no idea why I was going there. Five. You know, I'm five years old. Like, I just want to play. <laughs> right? So I remember... I used to say to my mother when she would take me to uh, the Quran classes, I would say to her, I would say to her, is memorizing the Quran wajib? <laughs> I'll say that to her. And she said to me, it's wajib, Raya, be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So she would take me five years from the age of five to the age of 10. I was only going there because my mom was taking me there. My parents were telling me, you have to go there, right? And then when I got to the age of 10, I remember I was sitting in my class, one of the Duxi classes. And I remember the teacher was explaining something on the board in Arabic. He was writing something in Arabic and explaining it. And I just started daydreaming. I started thinking to myself, you know, if only I understood that Arabic, that would be the greatest goal that perhaps I could achieve. Mm. So that's what I was thinking to myself. So I didn't do anything about it. But subhanAllah, a year later, um, my local masjid, which is quite... I started frequently going to the masjid And then when I started going to the masjid frequently uh, I started doing the adhan Calling the adhan in the masjid mm. So um, when I started calling the adhan I remember I used to go like half an hour before yeah. the adhan <laughs> Make sure nobody beats me So there's the no adhan. politics around the adhan in there, was no, there, was no, there was no politics but it was competitive yeah, Like yeah. whoever comes there would do the adhan okay, okay. So I was trying to make sure that my mark was there That mm. people wouldn't take the adhan <laughs> from me So I'd come half an hour early sometimes As soon as I'd come back from school Because I was in secondary school all the time mm. I would literally change my uniform And get into my thobe And rush to the masjid to be, get there For what, if maybe it was asr or whatever Early so nobody beats me to the adhan so when I used to do the Adhan in the masjid, there was some Shaykh who came to, to a locality who just graduated from Jam Islam in Medina mm. at the time. So um, Sheikh Ismail and Sheikh Ibrahim and Sheikh Mahmoud and the Mashaykh, they came to a locality and they started some, some programs in our masjid. And then after that, they started an institute. So Sheikh Ismail, he saw me one day. I, I literally remember I called the Adhan and the Sheikh was sitting in the corner of the masjid. He called me, he said, Yahya, come here. He said, Kare, come here. So I came to him, he said, he asked me, how much of the Quran have you memorized? So I said to him, at that time, I've already memorized a few ajza and it wasn't very solid. Yani. I'd, I'd forgotten a lot of it and I hadn't learned it with tajweed and so on. So he said to me, listen, we're, we're, there's a new institute that we're starting. I want you to come there on Saturday. So I said, khair, I'm, I'll be there. And at the time, I was, I think I was around 12 years old. And I said, khalas. So every Saturday morning, I used to take two buses to get to the institute. And uh, it was like 9 a.m. I had to be there and I would go there. But the privilege I got because I was quite young, uh, I used to get uh, taken home by the Mashaikh. So I used to be in the same car as them. Okay. So I got a lot of time with, to spend with them, Yani, and also just observe them and learn lots of just from the way they're interacting with each other, the stuff they're talking about in the car. And whilst I used to listen just quietly observing. Like an apprentice. Yeah, yeah like an apprentice. <laughs> exactly. So I used to go there and that's where my journey really started, subhanAllah. Because in the institute, they'll teach Arabic, Quran. So the Sheikh, the first day I went there, he tested me. It was like an assessment to see what level I'm at. He tested my Quran, he t- tested my general knowledge on Islam, my uh, ability to read and write Arabic and so on. And then they put me, it was, I started from like a beginner level, mm. very beginner. Like, And I started the Quran again from Surah Al-Nas because he said you have to learn with Tajweed. Mm. So that's where my journey with the Quran truly started again. Mm. And it took me about five years or just under five years perhaps to complete the Quran. And... Um, Alhamdulillah, يعني, it, it, it was perhaps one of the best uh, يعني, times in my life. يعني, I, it was looking back at it, I miss those days because sure. I remember we used to just, it was just learning. No. Else. Mm. We would go to the institute Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday to Thursday in the masjid, our mashaykh used to be in the masjid, so they used to do extra drus in the masjid. Mm. We used to have extra halaqat. Our, our sheikh who taught us the Quran, Sheikh Ismail, may Allah bless him, mm. he used to sit in the masjid every single day except Friday from Asr all the way to Isha. And he would be teaching Quran, Iqra, people reading to him, reciting to him, he's correcting the tajweed, some people are reading to him to get ijaza. people all different levels. This big halaq, the whole ground floor of the masjid used to be filled with people all different ages. 
yeah. and he kind of revived the all started i believe Mashallah. the science of tajweed and learning mm. quran properly in west london yani fadl azza wa jal and now all the hafaz and people who memorize quran and who are my generation or slightly older or maybe slightly younger they're all from the students of sheikh smaid all the students of his students. Mm. Right? So the Sheikh left behind a great legacy mm. in the area of Fadullah Azza wa Jal. And what's you know, amazing is that the Sheikh, he lived in our area at the beginning when he first started. However, he then moved to East London. We live in West London. Now to get from East London to West London, it could take like an hour and a half up to two hours. And he used to commute every single day by train to come to West London for the Quran halaqa. And what's even Greater than that is the Sheikh didn't charge anyone a single penny. It was all free. Not a single person used to pay a single penny. He used to come every single day, with the exception of Friday, and sit there from Asr all the way to Isha. And in the summer, Isha time is very late in the UK. Mm. It's like 11 p.m. So and he would, he sits here till 11 p.m. is there. And sometimes he would go home. Just he, he just makes it to the final train, which is sometimes midnight. And he will go home and I'm taking like maybe two hours, maybe a night a bit farther, one hour, one half maybe, to get home every single day. And he did that for years. Consistently without any breaks, Subhanallah. <laughs> Many uh... and until now nobody knows him. Subhanallah. He doesn't like to be known. Like Subhanallah. I always on my podcast I mentioned previous yeah. podcast. I always like to mention Sheikh because the Sheikh he doesn't he doesn't like anyone to know him. Yeah. So I want to make sure that people do know him because this is where you know our knowledge came from. This is the person who dedicated him and our other Sheikhs, Sheikh Ibrahim and Sheikh Mahmoud. You know, they put so much effort into us. And now looking back at it, the sacrifices they made in yeah. order to teach us, it was immense. It was great. Yeah. May Allah reward them. Amen. You see, young students of knowledge or potential students of knowledge, they look at the, the final product, man. They see the Sheikh on the, on the YouTube channel or on, on, on Instagram. And I think it's all glitz and glamour. Mm. And if you hear, you know, the, the commitment of these teachers, you know, mm. behind the scenes, mm -hmm. producing um, students constantly, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Mm. So we have this whole revival of um, reciting for Ijazah and, and mm. Asanid, something that has been revived here in South Africa also. I think probably for the last 20 years, it's, it's something new. Yeah. Traditionally, our Hufad uh, from Cape Town, they used to go to Mecca. And they used to do the Hiv in the Haram. MashaAllah. Mashaykh would return and they would have students, but we never heard of something called a, a, a Sanad or, mm. or an Ijaza. Mm. They had. Yeah. What, what we learned later is that they all had, but they never, they never mentioned passed it, it on. Yeah. They never yeah. mentioned it. And they had, uh, you know, Ijaza in different Turk and different uh, Riwayat, but it was never shared. Now we have this revival. Mm. Yes. Is it the same? Uh, it's the same. It's literally around the same time that you mentioned that revival started in the UK as well. Yeah. It was around a similar time that you were talking about that the revival kind of started in, in, in the UK and people started learning about ijazat and, mm. you know, and, and qiraat and so on. And now it's huge in the UK. Like you have, we have so many institutes that teach the qiraat, mm. all the different qiraat, and so many people have ijazat. Like it's become now normal. <laughs> yeah. Having ijazat yeah. in the Quran has become a norm. You know, <laughs> alhamdulillah azza wa jal. And alhamdulillah there's been a huge revival when it comes to people turning to the Quran, learning the Quran and memorizing the Quran. You know, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see. Very beautiful. That's very beautiful. I mean, if I look at myself, I started my, I started my uh, Islamic studies journey, say late 90s, 1999. And back then it was just like a Westerner. He doesn't have the tongue mm -hmm. for the Quran. So yeah, he yeah. would just like go, with, Quran would always be the weaker subject and he just Allah. gets mm -hmm. through to, you know, to get through the, Allah. to the next year. But now we see, you know, even people like Sheikh Muhammad the Mumble, mm -hmm. surpassing that, that mm -hmm. he's not from, not even Somali background, not yeah. even any he's English. Yeah, he's mm. English, and mm. he's you know um, overcome that. And then he mentioned also when he was here, he's slightly dyslexic. Also, he's dyslexic. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they overcome Allah. all those barriers Allah. to recite the Quran. Uh, you know, Allah. 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 It shows. It shows. Yani. Then Allah says, "Wa laqad yassarna al-Qur'an al-dhikr al-dhikr." Allah made it easy. Like you find people from all different backgrounds and people who don't speak the Arabic language, don't know Arabic, have memorized the Quran better than the Arabs, and it pronounces better than Arab. Perhaps you know, it's ajib. It's amazing. One thing I wanted to ask Sheikh with regards to the besides now the asanid and it's important. We've realized now, especially with the youth that that focus now on the Quran and like reviving the Quran and the Ijaza and the Sunnah of like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One thing that happens is once they get married or responsibilities come, mm -hmm. because at first it's just Quran, 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 studying mm -hmm. Deen. But then once the dunya comes and the responsibilities and the marriage, then it, it gets very difficult to balance the two. 
So mm-hmm. what nasiha and advice would you give such people that would really and it's are to, struggling to with make them? sure the Quran they don't leave it. Yeah, that is in general. Uh-huh. That is uh-huh. Uh-huh. the thing is, Subhanallah. You know, when something becomes a lifestyle, regardless of whatever changes in your life, it will remain in your life mm-hmm. because it's part of your lifestyle. So what a person needs to consider is that look, the Quran and these studies and what I have learned, it is my lifestyle. It's not something that is just extra. Mm. I'm doing it for a few years and the moment things, my circumstances change, that's halas, it goes out the window. Mm. It should be a part of your life, regardless. Especially the Quran. The Quran should never ever leave your life. Mm. The moment you lose the Quran, you have lost everything. No. Right? The Quran is what gives you that barak and everything else that you have. Whether it is your family, whether it is your wealth, whether it is your work, whether it is you, whatever it may be, Allah Taala put baraka in it. So the way you meant to view it and look at it, it is that the Quran is mubarak. Allah says it's mm. blessed, right? Allah tells us it's a source of baraka. Therefore, my time is in need of the baraka of the Quran. My wealth is in need of the baraka of the Quran. My life is in need of the baraka of the Quran. My offspring, my wife, my family, they are all in need of the Quran. Therefore, the more I give time to the Quran, the more time I dedicate to the Quran, the more everything I possess will have baraka. Mm. If you look at it like that, Allah will give you baraka and everything. Meaning some people, they say, I don't have time. But your time needs the Quran for you to have baraka in your time. Mm. Right? You and the people who give time to the Quran, they all say the same thing, that they find time in the day that other people who don't spend time on the Quran don't yeah. find. They, mm. they they manage to do so much because they give time to the Quran. Allah Taala, when you prioritize Allah, because prioritize the Quran is prioritizing Allah. It's a speech of Allah. It's an attribute mm. of Allah. When you prioritize the Quran, Allah puts you first. Mm. Allah prioritizes you. Yes, sir. Your affairs that you are so concerned about Because you have put Allah first Your your affairs are in the hands of Allah Allah will put you, your affairs first And take care of your affairs yeah. If you view it like that You will never worry mm. right? And the Quran will never actually leave your life Perhaps the more responsibility you have You're going to think You know what? I need more Quran for these things <laughs> yeah. It's not an either or yeah. Yeah. Right. I need to increase the amount of Quran The more time I'm spending the Quran And reciting the Quran And you know Reading the meaning of the Quran Reflecting upon the Quran Teaching others the Quran etc So that I can have more barakah And everything else that I have now mm. So Allah can bless it to me now Mashallah That's like the video of Sheikh Abdul Rashid Ali Sufi When he speaks Sahih. about his father Sahih. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Exactly Sheikh Abdul Rashid says that all the time And you <laughs> see it Sheikh Abdul Rashid is a prime example by the way Sheikh Abdul Rashid Ali Sufi May Allah bless him. Yani, Sheikh gives his, all of his time to the Quran. When even he's just sitting with you right now, he'll be beside the Quran. Mm-hmm. We travel with the Sheikh a number of times. And the Sheikh, when he when you're traveling with him, I remember we had a lecture. He was when he was in London. We had a lecture in West London in, in my local masjid. He delivered the lecture after Asr. After Maghrib, he had a lecture in North London. So to drive from North London to West London, it's about an hour drive. So we got in the car and we're going heading towards North London. So he said, Hey, yeah. Which means, where, where was my portion of the Quran? And where did I stop? And I remember he was in Surah Al-Mu'minun. He said, khalas. And he was reciting in Qira'at Abi Ja'far. So he said, khalas, ya jama'a, we're going to read Surah Al-Mu'minun. He recited a page. Next person in the car recited a page. Next. Until we got to our destination. And then we got to the destination. Do you think the Sheikh stopped there? He was Salat al-Maghrib, right? Salat al-Maghrib, he carries on from his word. Push the Quran. And then in the Muhadara, he starts off the Quran. He carries on from the word. And then <laughs> Salat al-Isha, the word. <laughs> he doesn't Allah. stop. Until he finished the word, the Qira'at of Ja'far. And then he started the Qira'at. And then I remember we had, we were, he was leading us at Qiyam al one of the masajids of Salat al-Isha. And then he stayed, carried on. And I remember he was on maybe Surah Araf. He started again, yani he finished the Qur'an. He started again Araf. Right? So that's how the Sheikh is. All his time is Qur'an. Sure. Either reciting it, teaching it, talking about it, encouraging others to learn it. Yani, uh, what do you call it? Praying salah. It's a sheikh, he's, he, whether he is musafir, he's a traveler, or he's a resident, he never abandons Qiyamul Layl. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That's something, one thing I've seen. In Qiyamul Layl, it's not short Qiyamul Layl. Sheikh reads a lot. Yeah. He would read many ajza. If you go to him in Ramadan, in his masjid in Qatar, the sheikh, what he does is, um, he's known for this. He finishes the Quran four times in Ramadan. In in, 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 tar- in Salah So he has one khatma in Taraweeh right? So he normally He reads Taraweeh normally yani, a night. But he starts Tahajjud from the first night of Ramadan So Tahajjud They finish the Quran Every 10, day, 10 nights They have a khatma on 10th night 20th night And then the last night of, of Ramadan So the first night of Ramadan Everyone knows The Sheikh Abdul Chi Is going to be Surah Al-Baqarah All of it in one rak'ah the first rakah of Taraweeh or Tahajjud, Surah Al-Baqarah, all of it. 
So those who come to the masjid, they know. They've been paid, yeah. They're prepared. One time, my brother came with us, and uh, he, he he was with us, and he didn't know. He didn't get the memo. <laughs> mm-hmm. So everyone's prepared. And those who know that can't stand for long, they have like these chairs. that yeah, yeah, them. So they take break, they sit and they stand, they sit and they stand. And the sheikh doesn't like people to sit, by the way. He, yeah. Because there's elderly people who are standing yeah. throughout. So the sheikh says, look, all these uncles, these elderly uncles are standing throughout the prayer. And you guys are young and you keep sitting. If you don't need, if you don't have a medical issue, don't sit. Mm. Teach yourself to stand. Yeah. You're healthy, you're fit. And the sheikh himself, he's not, yani, he's, he's not young anymore. Yani. He's not, you know, and he stands throughout as well. So he, oh, the brother, he came and the sheikh started. Alif Lami, Valik al Kitab, Ula Raiba, Fihi, Hudal Lil Muttaki, Aladina, Yuminuna, Bilraib, Yuki, Wana Salat, or Mim Marazakana, whom you fickle, Waladina, Yuminuna, Bima Unzida, Idekoma, Unzida, Mim Kabedik, or Bila Hirati, whom you can. The brother who's, who's there, he's enjoying it, saying, MashaAllah, I'm praying by Hashem Abdul Rashid. What a beautiful recitation. Shaq keeps going. He's thinking, Ah, oh, this is long, but it's, I'm enjoying it. He's thinking, Maybe the Shaq's gonna stop at the Jews. He carries on. He's thinking, La ilaha illallah. Maybe he'll stop at the next, next juz, tilka rasul. His sheikh gets tilka rasul. He's still carrying on. He's thinking, Ya Allah, the, the brother now, he's, his legs are shaking. <laughs> his legs are shaking. He's struggling to stand. The sheikh finishes, Fonsurna ala al qawmil kafirin. Allahu akbar. <laughs> the brother was like, Allahu akbar. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we finally got to this record. I've been waiting for so long. Yeah. So now the Sheikh, mashallah, yeah, he yeah. is a person who, whether he's traveling or he's a resident, Quran, in Salah, yeah. outside of Salah, etc., is always present. I actually Allah. recall that I was speaking to Sheikh Al Wajid that came recently, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. also one of the students of Sheikh Sufi, no. uh, Ali Sufi. Sheikh Abdul Rashid, yeah. So he was saying that, like, he, he got stuck in, in Joburg when they were coming, they said they were waiting for. Uh, the petrol, or I don't know what, what they were waiting for. So it was delayed for like an hour or two or three. Uh, so the sheikh, when he came, I just saw him walking around and reciting. So I told him, sheikh, what's your word and how are you going about it? He's like, today we got stuck. So I just read 11 ajizah. I'm still trying yeah, to read Allah, it. Allah, and I was yeah. 11 ajizah and Allah, it's just Allah. by the way for him. We go so, to the desk and when there's a flight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Allah. So we would be stressing, but for so them it's the like lining, it's an opportunity. So the so the One time the sheikh, he goes in Norway. He was, he, he was in a conference with Abdul Rashid in Norway. And the, so there was a lot of brothers, young people who were there for the, for the conference, the Mu'tamar. And they were staying in the masjid. It's a big masjid in, in Oslo called Masjid Tawfiq. So the sheikh, he came in at night time. And this was normally the time people either be sleeping or they would be in ibadah. So sheikh, he saw all the youngsters sitting around and just chatting the whole night. So he walked into the masjid and he didn't like it that they, were, they weren't used, utilizing their time at that time. So sheikh, he walked in, he saw them, he went straight to the mihrab, turned the mic, he went, Allahu Akbar, he started praying. So then, of course, when all of them saw Sheikh Abdul Rashid praying, we have to join him in Salah. Yani. You can't sit around talking. So they all joined him in Salah. <laughs> After Fatiha, <laughs> Allah, Lina, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alif, Lam, Mim, Allah, La, Ilah, Ilah, Al Hayy, Al Qayyum. He started Al Imran. <laughs> and he recited all of Al Imran in the first rak'ah. <laughs> and then the second rak'ah, they got up and they're thinking, Ya Allah, please not Nisa. Please not Nisa. <laughs> He said, They're thinking, Ya Allah, please don't make a surah al We've just struggled with Al-Imran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ida zunzilatil Arda zilzala. And then he did zilzala. After he finished the two rakats, he turned around and he said, Hey, yeah, Masiwadna, should we carry on? And they said, Sheikh, we're going to sleep. Salam alaikum. It's a prime example of tarbiyah with ibadah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Allah barakatuh. Mashallah. So after you completed your hifz, you started your education at, or you completed your hifz at the same institute. The same institute while doing all the Islamic called, science as well. Badr? It's called Badr. It was called at the time Badr Islamic Institute. Badr Islamic, Islamic Institute. institute. No. I, 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 before we add the, you know, obviously in preparation for the podcast, we were watching video some home. videos. We saw a video of you when you were young. Aha, uh-huh, yes. Shimar. This, this has always been my look since I was very young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mashallah. And uh, you were explaining, uh, you started at the institute at a very young age. You exactly. And I had a stutter. Oh, I learned Arabic. I had a stutter. Oh, I saw you. Did you watch the stutter, the, the video when I was very young and I had a stammer and I was talking? 
Did you see that? No, 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 I was watching no. it. Was, it was a different one. Now. Yeah, it was a different. Did I have one. a beard in the one you watched? You watched? Uh, uh, no beard. If I had no beard, then it must be the one I had. No, it was. It was the one where you spoke about how I learned Arabic, and then it shows like little. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So it, there's actually an original video where that clip came from, where I looked very young. Yeah. And I went, if you actually watch that clip, I had a stammer. Mm. So I used to have a, a stammer when I when I, I was younger, and Subhanallah, you worked on it, Sheikh, or did it no, disappear? It, by... I, I I didn't work on it directly, but it kind of went away with the Quran. Subhanallah, mm. Subhanallah, that's one thing that is one of the barakat of the Quran, yani, that I used to find it. If you actually watch that video, there would not be a single sentence except that I would. I kind of do have the stutter now, but it's not as noticeable. Mm. But no, I would. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I would actually struggle to, you know, form a sentence because of how difficult it was, right? So then, Subhanallah, over time, and also I, I believe it's with the Quran, yani, mm. uh, it it helped a lot, mm. right? Uh, when I tell people now that I used to have a stammer, they don't believe me. Mm. There's one Qari uh, from, from South Africa is based in America now. When he speaks, he, stutters, he stammers. When he it's recites, it's not, not at all. Mm. Exactly. I've I, seen that as well. I, I, that's mm. amazing. Too. It is amazing. It really is. So this, uh, this institute that you studied in? Yeah. Uh, Padre Institute. Yes. How long was the program? that you? And it was it during the week? Was it like a full-time program? Or was it? It was just it? over the weekends. So okay. it was Saturday, Sundays, we used to go as part-time. We used to go then Saturday, Sundays. And uh, I was there for five years. Mashallah. Five years, so okay. studying there five years. I started from the beginning, memorizing the Quran, learning Arabic, everything I started from scratch. I went through the levels and Alhamdulillah, after five years, I graduated from there. Mm. And then I, st I started teaching there. Okay. And then what happened was that when uh, we started teaching, after we graduated, our mashayikh who initially taught us, uh, the, some of them became very busy, some of them moved mm. away, etc. And only one of the original mashayikh who taught us, Sheikh Muhammad, uh, was left. So what happened was that the, my generation, my group that graduated with me, we actually re-established the institute with Sheikh Mahmoud again. Okay. And we became the teachers. Okay. And that's when I started teaching properly and we re-established it and we rebranded it and then it became Bedr Academy. Okay. You okay. might have seen Bedr Academy. Right? Yes, yes, yes. It became Bedr Academy after that. And uh, Alhamdulillah, yani, when I was there, uh, it, was, it wasn't as diverse. Mm. It was mainly Somali students who mm. studied there because a lot of the mashayikh were, of course, they were all Somali and also... Mm. Um, they, their English wasn't great, all of them. Mm -hmm. So some of the classes we used to have in Arabic, some of them we used to have in Somali. Uh, so when we started, uh, because we're teaching in English, Alhamdulillah, it became more diverse and, mm. you know, uh, it spread. And, and Alhamdulillah, and it, was, uh, I, it was probably the most enjoyable time. I, mm. I, I currently don't teach at Badr. Um, they made me retire. <laughs> they made me retire. And a lot of people, when I tell them, they ask me because people think I still teach there. Because uh, I go there still I, I supervise the classes I help out etc But I don't teach And the reason why I don't teach Is because The way Badr functions It is that The students who were Students at the academy They eventually have to become teachers Right So they go on to the become baton, teachers yeah. Exactly we, we had on the baton Yeah mm. So what happened was that uh, My generation were teaching for a while And then my students became teachers as well Whilst mm. I was there and their students also became teachers while I was there. And then what happened after that was um, we wanted, because in order for a project, a DAO project to be sustainable and to continue, it can't rely on individuals. Mm. It has to be something that keeps going, it's even if brilliant. you pass away, yes, even if you become busy, whatever. So Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Mahmoud had that vision. Yani, you know, Sheikh, may Allah bless him. Mm. And he is a visionary, honestly. He, is a, he thinks ahead very far. So he told us, this is 2020, the corona year. He told us, listen, we're all taking a step back. Myself and himself, even and others, we all took a step back so that the other teachers now who were students previously who started teaching, mm. that they take the resp responsibility fully. fully and they don't rely on us, mm. right? So they are also the management and they are also the teachers and they're doing everything. And subhanAllah, now they are fully managing it. We only supervise, we just attend some meetings here and there, and we come and we visit and we help out also. Mm. But they do everything and they are doing such a great job. Mashallah. It shows us It's a real life example That you know You need to trust The next generation no. You need to Let them make mistakes as well mm. Let them learn You know And make mistakes And, and learn So that these projects, these DAO projects especially, mm. can be sustainable and they carry on. And it will be like it's for you, you know, even yeah. if you, whilst you're not doing anything, perhaps Allah is rewarding you for it, inshallah. Mm. So in 2020, I took a step back. But I'm still there, Badr. Yani. Badr is my home. It's, it's, <laughs> it's in my heart. I can never ever yani, leave Badr. Mm. Um, but my time teaching there was probably the most enjoyable time. Mm. Uh, I used to teach on Saturdays, right? And I used to start at 9 a.m. and finish at 9 p.m. 12 hours 
12 hours. I had one hour. Sheikh, obviously you weren't married back then. I wasn't married. I wasn't married. <laughs> it's before I got married. If, if, if it was whilst I'm married, I would be slaughtered. <laughs> uh, subhanallah. So subhanallah, what happened was that I would, and I used to look forward to it so much. Mm. Every week I look forward to it because it's one day a week, by the way. Yeah. The brothers come on Saturdays. Now, and the way we, we, we work. And the sisters, they come on Sundays. So we don't teach the sisters. They have females teaching them. We teach the brothers. So we used to have two shifts, a morning shift, which was like five hours, right? Or six hours, I can't remember. And then the evening shift, which was also five hours, six hours. So we used to have one hour gap for the teachers to kind of rest between mm. uh, the two shifts. That one hour, the students used to like ask me Flock, questions yeah. or they would come to me. and we, So I wouldn't even eat the whole day. The whole day I would just be drinking water and subhanAllah, I wouldn't realize until the day is over. Yeah, and then at know. the end, I'd be like, wait, I didn't eat all day. Mm. <laughs> we used to call it amongst ourselves, yeah, the teachers, we used to call it Suyam Bila Ajab. Fasting without road. <laughs> it's like you're fasting the whole day Allah. and you haven't made the intention yet, and you just haven't eaten the whole day. Allah. And khalas, we said, sometimes we say to us, like, we should just, if it wasn't a Saturday, we should just fast every, every Saturday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, Allah. so Alhamdulillah, it was so Allah. enjoyable. Beautiful and days. the reason why it was so enjoyable, and I love this so much, because the students who we teach are people who actually are motivated to learn. Mm. They want to be there. They really want to learn. They're eager to learn. So when the teacher has students who are eager to learn, who yeah. really want it's to, motiva- it, motivates you. it pushes you, you know? Mm. So you forget all the tiredness or the fatigue or the, or the hunger, whatever. You don't feel it until you're done. Mm. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So, okay, mashallah. So, uh, this program that you studied in, was it based like on, on like, your, because you said those mashayikh that you studied under, they were graduates from the Islamic University of Medina. Yeah. Was it like based on a similar type of program? No. Um, so, w- during my time, my time is quite different. Uh, it's different to how Bedr Academy is today. Okay. When we studied the mashayikh, they tried a number of different things with us. Whether it, w- it was the Arabic program. So, the Arabic pro- program, our Sheikh Sheikh Mahmoud, he tried different things with us, different approaches. So we didn't actually learn from one specific curriculum. Okay. If people ask me, what curriculum do you use to learn Arabic? And I tell them, I don't know because I didn't learn from a specific curriculum. Each year, because we were like the guinea pigs, the guinea pigs yeah, you know, yeah. trying different things, see what works, mm. you know, then to kind of figure out what the right formula is that might work mm. for students. So one year we would have this specific curriculum. I remember one of them, one year was like a Philistine. Mm. A curriculum. Another year it was like uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Muhammad uh, bin Saud. <laughs> yeah, different ones. So each year will be different ones. I don't remember lots of stuff. And a lot of the stuff we used to do, Sheikh Mahmoud is so talented that he never even used to use a curriculum. He used to teach Arabic from himself. Because mm. he's and now when I look at him, I'm like Sheikh. When Genius. I was teaching Arabic, like like I needed something to go off. Like mm. I, I need some material. Preparing everything from my head and bringing material my, of my own is it's, mm. it's a lot of work. Right, but he used to do a lot of that, and even when he taught us grammar, we initially didn't learn grammar from a text. Mm. He taught us grammar in like a natural way, mm. right? And then after that, we started learning grammar from a, a book called Nahul Wadi. Yeah. Right? So you might have heard yeah, it's quite yeah. famous because it's it's kind of academic the way it's mm. structured, right? It has exercises and so on. It was not, it wasn't until very later we started learning the, the mutun of of, of Nahu, like mm. Al-Ajrumi and so on, right? Uh, and then also with the other Islamic sciences, we learned hadith. Of course, we learned um, we learned also fiqh. We learned uh, the fiqh was mainly yani, uh, Shafi'i fiqh because um, we're Somalis. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are Shafi'is too. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Allah. Shafi'i is not Shafi'i. Hanbali. Is Hanbali close enough? Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> but even, I, no, to be honest, we actually did Hanbali fiqh, a bit of Hanbali fiqh yeah. as well. Um, so we did a bit of Hanbali fiqh, but uh, it was mainly Shafi'i fiqh. So, um, of course, you start with the small books no. of the Shafi'i fiqh, Sefirah to Najah and all that no. stuff, right? And then after Matan Abu Shijah, and we may not or may not from, or way up from there. Um, we, in, in Hadith, um, we started off with Al Arba'in, Al Ba'un Nawi, of mm. course, like everyone does. And we also learned a, a, a Text in Musallah Hadith. Mm. Um, there's there's a risala by Sheikh Ibn Taymin yeah. that he has in Musallah yeah. Hadith. We learned that first, and then after that we did uh, Al Bayquni, and then after that we, it was gradual, mm. you know, moving okay. up to a different text oh, sure. per, per okay. level. Um, also in Tajweed with Sheikh Ismail, we did um, the Mutun of Tajweed to Hafat Al Fal. Mm. Prior to Hafat Al Fal, we had like a, a Tajweed textbook, which it was called, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot his name. I think it's called Taysir Al Rahman. Uh, Al Rahman. No, no, Taysir Al Bari. No, there's, no, a, there's another one called it's not, it's not two volumes It's, it's no, like it's a small loaded. book It's a small oh, okay. tiny book It's like it has a light green ca- cover okay. I forgot his name But we learned to, the rules of read Through that first And then after that We did Tuhfat al We made us memorize it And then after Al-Jazariya yeah. uh, and, and so on 
and uh, also we aqidah of course we did a number of texts in aqidah and so on so it was, it was an, a number of different okay. texts that we did per mm. level um nice. that the mm. mashayikh they saw that was fit for us to learn uh before the last uh, yeah that's so that was like Which, the assist level mm. giving us like a foundation oh. to, to kind of build on when we mm. first started seeking knowledge or something alhamdulillah never never um i know i, I know amongst the western dua and not so much maybe in cape town but the UK and America, most of the du'at wants to go to Saudi and oh, ne- yes. never applied, never intended to go to Saudi. Jimmy, that's a good question. So have I never intended to go to Saudi? Of course I intended. Mm. Uh, and I applied to the Islamic University media a number of times and also other universities in Saudi Arabia I applied. But Allah has never decreed it. Yes, I Allah know. never decreed it. But subhanAllah, I am I'm a great believer and huge believer in whatever Allah has decreed for you is always khair. No. Right, subhanAllah, I never yani, went to the universities uh, out there but uh, that didn't demoralize me or stop me from learning. Universities came to you. Yeah, so no. I actually furthered my studies and, and did Sharia in another university, no. an Islamic university. So and it teaches you also that just because you don't get one opportunity, no. you shouldn't stop. Mm, right? yeah, it happens with certain Many problems. students get discouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You should carry on because you know knowledge is not in one place. Mm. It's everywhere. Mashaykh everywhere. It's just a matter of you looking for them and searching mm. for them and learning from them, benefiting from them. So Alhamdulillah, yani Allah Taala to open these other opportunities before the Allah Azza wa Jal. And Alhamdulillah, I, I think I benefited. I hope so. Definitely. Best approach to learning Arabic. These two ways that we generally have in Cape Town. Not so much the Sikh, the Muhadatha way. Yeah, and the Nahaw way. And then how which one? How is more Indo Pak kind of uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is quite old school. Even old school Somalis do that as well. But I believe the Muhadith way is more is more um, beneficial, uh, beneficial. Yeah. because you know Nahu comes anyway. Now, once someone knows how to communicate in language, when you teach him the rules of why he's saying this and why he's using this mm. and so on, it makes more sense to him. He picks it up faster. Mm. That's how I learned. We never started with Nahu. Qawaid and Nahu, I never learned it until very late, mm-hmm. later on in my journey of Arabic. But uh, the, the vocabulary and also uh, sentence structure and ta'abir and all that stuff, mm-hmm. that was the first thing that the Sheikh he focused on. And that's the same thing that we do in Badr at the moment as well, that we focus on those things and so mm-hmm. on. Alhamdulillah. And I believe okay. it's, more, it's more effective. I think so. I'm going to reverse a bit back into this Shall discussion with regards to your father's rule of uh, speaking Somali at home. So... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with the son of um, uh, uh, yeah, like a, a big miracle. We were married for 17 years, no kids, and he came in Allah November. Allah. So now I'm thinking about Allah bless him. What's his name? Hamza. Hamza. Allah, may Allah <laughs> so I'm thinking about Hamza's future and not wanting him to struggle to learn Arabic at one point in his life. You know, do you think that's possible to like speak Arabic at home and no. 100%. Go, okay, 100%. With, 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 you know better kids. than me, Sheikh. But yani, of course, the language that you speak to your children in, it's going to stick with them forever. Mm-hmm. Right? So, of course, he's going to learn like, English when he goes out. He's mm-hmm. going to learn Afrikaans when he goes out, when he goes to school, and so mm-hmm. on. All these other languages, he will eventually learn them at school. But the language that he perhaps will never ever learn properly in South Africa is probably Arabic. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, because you have been blessed, Sheikh, with Arabic and you were able to speak it and so on, if you are communicating with Arabic and he picks it up from a young age, it's a great, great head start mm. to have mm. to learning Quran and to learn all the other mm. Islamic science. It will give him a huge key because the Arabic and the Quran are two major keys to unlock the other Islamic sciences. Yeah. Mm. Once you have the Quran and you have the Arabic language, everything else tends to be easier, right? And you tend to find the students who learn those two matters, that they tend to find it easier to progress with the other Islamic sciences. Whereas those who haven't learned Arabic properly mm. or they haven't learned the Quran, mm. or they may know Quran but they haven't memorized the Quran in totality, they tend to perhaps struggle. Mm-hmm. A bit more with the other sciences because all the other sciences are basically based on these two. Mm-hmm. The Quran, everything you hear in the other sciences, قال Allah, Allah said this, Allah said this. So if you would know the ayat, it mm-hmm. makes more sense. And if you have the, have the Arabic, it's easy for you to comprehend it as well, mm-hmm. right? So and you get, under, get a better understanding and you can perhaps excel further. So Alhamdulillah, of course, I recommend that 100%. Mm-hmm. Allah. Sure. We have many examples in Cape Town, local mashayikh that speak only Arabic to the kids. Do, do I have? Do no, you... I say they are. Obviously, I don't know uh, any. Is it really? Then, then you'll be the first. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, they, they're, they're all families with a mother, the father. Way. They've actually concocted their own uh, dialect of, uh, of, Arabic. of Arabic. Yeah, wow. I visited a, a friend, and they speaking in the house, and I don't comprehend. Sa- I hear African, African words. Uh, I hear Arabic words, but yeah. I don't yeah. understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like Allah. yeah, something khas for 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 the for the family. Yeah, it's like. Mashallah. Sheikh, I wanted to ask you one thing pertaining your approach of doing da'wah. Like I've seen a lot of the du'as lately, especially those qurra, 
I think the approach of reciting and like um how do I say attracting those people's hearts with the, the beauty of the Quran. Mm. So yeah. like um I've seen that is there anyone that inspired you towards taking this path because I've seen a few that take this path. So do you have anyone that you perhaps uh, imitate in this role or Jameen, in this way? Um in terms of the Quran being the center of the da'wah, I believe that that should be the center of everyone's da'wah. Right? Yeah. Because what else are you going to call the people to? Mm. Right, you're going to be calling to Allah. So if you're going to call them to Allah, what's a better way to call them to Allah through the speech of Allah? Instead of just making things up yourself and constantly yeah. just saying things and so on, there's no speech that's more effective than the speech of Allah. Okay. Even for those who do not understand it, it affects them. I remember, um, I can't remember when it was, but I had a lecture in one of the universities um, a while back. And uh, my talk was about the Quran and it was, I think it was during what they call Discover Islam Week. So it's mm. focusing on... You know, ISOX. Yeah, ISOX, yeah. Mm. So it's focusing on, you know, get, uh, presenting Islam to the non-Muslims and so mm. on. So I was talking about the miracle of the Quran and so on. And of course, I would be reciting the ayat during uh, my lecture. There were some non-Muslims there and some of them came to me after and they said, you know, when we heard, and they said, you know, the way you were singing it, that's what he said, right? yeah. the way you were singing it, you know, I really felt <laughs> something there. I really felt something. And that's exactly what Allah tells us. And in the Quran, it's addressing the hearts. No. Even those who don't necessarily understand its language, the heart recognizes it. Mm. It recognizes the truth. Right. Uh, Allah Azza wa says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ Right. Allah Azza wa these ayat of Fasirun, they say they're revealed because of the Abyssinians no. in Abyssinia no. who didn't understand Arabic. Christians. Mm. When they heard the Quran, they started crying mm. because of the truth that they recognized. Mm. Right? So subhanAllah, the hearts, they recognize the truth. Even in Najashi, and some of the first room, they say this ayah was real because mm. of Najashi. Najashi is non Arabic. No. He doesn't speak Arabic. When Ja'far radiallahu anhu is speaking to Najashi, he's speaking to Najashi through an interpreter. Mm. Right? And he recites to him Surah Maryam. And Najashi cries until his beard became moist. And he doesn't understand the language. Imagine, it shows you just the effect that the Quran has on even those who don't understand it. So, what about those who understood it? Those who understood it, even those who didn't believe in it, they heard the Prophet recite Surah Al Najm. And they're all listening. And then when he recited the last ayah, Fasjudu lillahi wa abudu, prostrate to Allah and worship, they all prostrated. The Quran overpowered them mm. to the extent that people outside of Mecca thought that all of Mecca embraced Islam. Muslim. Right? So it shows you that the Quran, it really has a great effect on, on mm. people. So, of course, the da'wah should be centered around mm. the Quran. And it, I think it's more effective because what we should be calling people to is Allah said and the Prophet mm -hmm. said. And then on top of that, when the Quran is recited, and because reciting the Quran in a melodious voice with tajweed and so on, it's one of the wasail, one of the means to um, affect the heart even more, right? To kind of convey the meaning of the verse uh, to the heart even more. So, of course, yeah, I need to soften the hearts and to kind of attract the hearts and to have effect on the hearts. Reciting those ayat, it has a great effect on it. Mm. Not only on those who are listening, but even the one who's reciting. Right? Sometimes, uh, I kid you not, that sometimes I'll be delivering a lecture and perhaps I've spoken about this topic before. But I'll recite an ayah and I will feel emotional during that recite, the recitation of the ayah. As if perhaps, you were listening to As if for, you I'm hearing for the first yeah. time. Mm. As uh, if I'm hearing for the first time. And I think that's only fatah min Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah grants us those open openings. And uh, but uh, when I've experienced that, I thought to myself, and these verses I've recited in the past for years. I've I've recited many times and again and again. But Subhanallah, sometimes you recite an ayah, and you discover something in an ayah that you haven't discovered before, mm. and it affects you a lot more, right? Mm. So that's the effect of the Quran, and that's why the the effect of the Quran never stops. Uh, it always affects people So if you take that approach in da'wah I think it's, 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 it's great I remember there was a time when, when I started actually my da'wah There was a time that people were saying to me that You know um, you, What's your evidence for reciting ayat During your lecture Just randomly reciting the ayat With tartil and tajweed and so on So I, I said to them that, What do you mean? The asal is to recite the Quran with tartil they said, they said, no, 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 this, you know, this is, we have no evidence for this. You can't be reciting ayat. Mm. Reciting ayat Quran normally is, is understood, but during a lecture that you're doing, tartil of the ayat, what evidence do you have of that? I said to you, Jamaat al-Khair, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, when he would convey the Quran to the Sahaba, mm. radiallahu anhu, he recited to them. Yeah. Right? In Daru Arqam, Ibn Abdul Arqam, three years, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam was educating the Sahaba with what? What was his da'wah around? Quran. 
everything that he was teaching them, reciting Quran to them, right? So, the, and the Quran is revealed to recite it in a certain way. So, why do I need to find extra evidence <laughs> to <laughs> prove something that already exists, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, it's quite, it quite strange. And then, years later, some of them came to me and they apologized. They said, you know what, Sheikh so and so said a fatwa that is allowed, so please forgive us. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Zakallah khair, yani, I say to you, Allah said, and the Prophet Ali said, you say Sheikh so and so. Uh, one last question, inshallah. I think our time is running out inshallah, quickly. Inshallah. So, um, when you read Salat al Isha, no. then you were reciting, there was like a hint of Sheikh Haytham al Dukhain. When you get into your car, Sheikh, or your playlist, no. would you, who does Sheikh so, Yahya Rabi listen to? Nowadays, Sheikh Haytham al Dukhain is always <laughs> on play. So, Allah, that Sheikh, as I don't know, he's also like very really, unique. And... Is a, yeah. Very unique. Style is unique. It really also takes me to another. He does. He really level. does. He really does. I'm glad we have another Sheikh from Tukhain flat. Because I'm a big fan. So the Sheikh from Tukhain, subhanAllah. And you have Allah. the good pleasure of spending some time. Yes, I met him a number of times. May Allah bless him, honor him, and grant him khair in wherever he is. And we, hopefully, he'll see this. We give salam to Sheikh from Tukhain in Qatar. I'm actually going to visit him after uh, I leave South Africa, inshallah. In Allah. So he'll see this and he will, he will be happy, inshallah. I'll tell him all the brothers in South Africa. We, we, we uh, I'll listen really, to him. Yeah, hopefully, you should, you come visit. visit. You should visit. You should come visit, inshallah. The Sheikh Hitim. I know that one happened in Ramadan, Sheikh. What Sheikh told me. He's, uh -huh. he's Allah. Qatar property in Ramadan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ramadan, no way. But I'll say Ramadan, inshallah. Yeah. So Sheikh Haytham al Dukhain, subhanAllah, I discovered him a few years ago. I think I discovered him in 2018. At that time, the Sheikh wasn't really that known. I randomly came across a video on YouTube. And it was a video of the message that he leads in. It was like a live stream of Taraweeh. So then I thought, wait, I've never seen like reciters in Qatar before. Mm. But the only reciter I know in Qatar is Sheikh Abdul Rashid. Mm. So I was like, let me see what the Qatari reciters sound like. Uh -huh. So then I just started, uh, you know, skimming through the, the it was because it was a long stream, it was like one hour and a half, going through different reciters. And then subhanAllah, Sheikh Haytham was one of the Imams leading. And I listened to him and I was like, wow, this sounds nice. Mm -hmm. His recitation is very beautiful. And then I thought to myself, because the way he recites, it's an Iraqi style, they call it. Mm -hmm. It's the Iraqi way of reciting Quran. So I thought he was Iraqi. Mm. So I thought, mashallah, they have an Iraqi Sheikh has come to Qatar. Yeah, yeah. Yani. That's what I thought. And then a year later, I saw that he there was, clips, there was clips of him on Instagram okay. that someone made of his du'as and so on. Yeah. Right? And, they trans and, and they translated and really, it, yeah. yeah, his du'as. And then I was like, oh, this is the same Sheikh that yeah. I saw in 2018. And then, uh, subhanAllah, Sheikh, he became very popular. And then I had the pleasure to interview him on Instagram. Oh, and we did like a live on Instagram. We spoke about you know, his background. And just prior to that, I found out that he was Yemeni. The Sheikh's originally from Yemeni, from Yemen. And people in Yemen have beautiful voices anyway. Mm. Right? And then he, I asked him that question, Sheikh, you're from Yemen. How did you develop, develop the Iraqi style? And he told me that the Iraqi style, he went to one time to a Quran competition in Lebanon. And he met an Iraqi brother there. One time. One time, yeah. <laughs> and he met an Iraqi brother there. And he saw the way he was reciting. And he was exposed to the way he, the way he was reciting. And he's like, this is very beautiful. Teach me. Mm. So the Iraqi brother taught him how to recite the Iraqi way. Oh. And the Sheikh took it. And ever since he's, he's been reciting like that. <laughs> so subhanAllah, I now, subhanAllah, yani, Sheikh Haytham Dukhain, because I listen to him so much, that they are like bits that yeah. come into my recitation of him. Like, and I can't help, I don't even do it intentionally. Yeah. It's just because I listen so often and I enjoy his recitation so much. Mm -hmm. yani. And there's no the kind of, in, you know, yeah. it just comes yeah, naturally. Yeah, yeah naturally. Comes. He doesn't try. He doesn't try yeah. at all. He just comes, subhanAllah. When I was in Qatar in, um, in March, um, he invited us to his house. So we prayed Salat Maghrib with him, or Isha, I can't remember, one of them in his house. And he led us in Salat al Isha or Maghrib. And I remember he recited Surah Ahqaf and he recited in a way that he doesn't normally recite. Right? He just starts Surah Ahqaf. I remember it was last page where he Salafna ilayka nafara min al jinn. And he recited in such a beautiful manner that I never heard before. And I said to him, Sheikh, please record this for me. I need to hear this again. <laughs> right? So I remember that same time that I was in Qatar, he, uh, he made me leave Salat al Fajr in his masjid. So I led Fajr. In the first rak'ah, I recited, you know, my Fatiha normally. In the second rakah, I recited Fatiha in a way that I normally used to recite in the, in the second rakah. It used to happen. So after the Salah, the Shaykh said to me, that's Fatiha that you recited in the second rakah. He said, no, he said to me, let me hear it again. He liked it. It wasn't his Fatiha. It was, he said, let me hear it again. So he, he made a repeat. So it, it goes a bit like this. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So he's like, again, do it again. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين so he had it and he went quiet for a moment and then he said he made his own version using what I just recited <laughs> he said الحمد لله رب العالمين I said Sheikh your version is better than mine I said <laughs> Sheikh I said I'm taking yours <laughs> <laughs> As I oh, so Sheikh, he has a very good ear when he comes to listen to Qurra. Okay. And then what he does is that when he listens to Qurra, he takes things from them and he makes his own. Mm. And that's why his voice is so unique. Yeah. Sure. May Allah Azza bless him. Yeah. MashaAllah. Yeah. And he really, really, when you listen to his, his recitation, it's, you can really yani, feel the meaning yeah. Yeah. in a lot of the ayat. Yeah. Sheikh, I think uh, yeah, but we've run out of time. We've, yeah, we ran out of time. Closing remarks, Sheikh. Closing remarks. Remarks. Nasiha to the Shabab of South Africa. Yeah. First of all, I'm extremely happy to be here and I'm enjoying my stay in South Africa, honestly. It's, um, I did a lot of research before I came to South Africa. Uh, like an so you knew do. about load shedding and you knew yeah, about... Yeah, I the... know the load shedding is the only thing I didn't know about. <laughs> That caught me off guard. Just I was telling the brothers early on. That's not mentioned on that's not me- That's not mentioned online. <laughs> <laughs> for a reason, bro. <laughs> I think for tourist reasons, no, they're not mentioned. No. <laughs> but everything else, you know, I kind of do. My, but mashallah, I, I, South Africa is mashallah, exceeded my expectations. May Allah bless you all. Mm-hmm. And if, you, if there was uh, some advice that I would give to myself and all my brothers and sisters who are in South Africa and elsewhere as well, it is that the deen of Allah, the religion of Allah, is the greatest blessing that we've been granted. Mm-hmm. And Allah has chosen us from all his slaves and favored us with Islam. And when you have such a great blessing, only the one who doesn't have this blessing really knows his value. Yeah. The one who's missing it knows his value. And the one who's come to Islam and embraced Islam and reverted or converted truly understand what it means to be a Muslim. And the Prophet Ali Salat said in the hadith, and I always love to mention the hadith because it really touches my heart every time that he said, Ali Salat, in Allah, dunya, man yuhib, man la yuhib, that yeah. Allah grants dunya worldly matters to those that he loves and those he does not love. Wa inna Allah la dina illa man ahab. But Allah has not granted deen, Islam, religiosity, except to those that he loves. Just the fact that Allah has granted us Islam is a sign that Allah loves us. So we need to show gratitude for Allah, to Allah, for that Islam and that blessing by doing exactly what we were created for, ibadah. Right? And we're not being requested or asked to do amazing things and to go, you know, be like the great bad lab. Just do that which Allah obliges upon us because the most beloved deeds to Allah and other obligatory deeds. Mm-hmm. If you manage to do that and you manage to perfect that, everything else will come. But it's a matter of just make sure that you observe what Allah obliged upon you. Make sure that your five daily prayers, you're praying on time. You are being dutiful to your parents. You're one who's doing what Allah Taala has um, obliged upon you, etc. If you do that, you'll be amongst those who Allah Taala loves and is pleased with. And if you do that, like the man who came to the Prophet Ali Sallam said, that I'll just do the obligatory deeds. Mm-hmm. The Prophet Ali Sallam said, you enter Jannah if you do so. Right? Yeah. Another hadith is Aflah in Sadaq. If he's truthful, he's successful. Right? So Allah Tabarakut has made things difficult for us. It is us that complicate things. Allah has made things simple for us. It's just a matter of taking a step towards Allah. And when you take one step towards Allah, Allah Tabarakut facilitates everything else. So may Allah Tabarakut make things easy for us Amen. and aid us and assist us in His worship Amen. and forgive us for our shortcomings and have mercy upon us Amen. and grant us all beneficial knowledge so that we can worship Allah Tabarakut upon insight in the Holy Darikul Qadr Ali and gather us all in Jannah. It's like gather us here in this beautiful home, Sheikh Yusuf, and this beautiful city of Cape Town that He gathers in Jannah al Khuld with the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Salam. Ya Rabbi Alamin. Jazakum Allah Khair. May Allah bless you all. Jazakumullah khairan to Sheikh and to the brothers yeah. from the Asad podcast, inshallah ta'ala. We make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal that inshallah this is not our last meeting. Inshallah, inshallah. And I hope inshallah you take Sheikh. Uh, you, how long are you still in Cape Town? I'm here uh, a, a bit longer. I don't know to exact which day. But... Uh, inshallah take him for a scenic trip down uh, Camps Bay. You know, perhaps Chapman speak. I don't know if Chapman's table 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 is Chapman speak open. I don't know. Chapman speak, yeah, I think. That's open, inshallah, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Inshallah, we hope inshallah you enjoy your stay here, your, the remainder of your stay. Inshallah. And we make exactly. dua to Allah Azza wa Jal that exactly. whatever was mentioned inshallah is of benefit and Ameen. benefits Ameen. to those who are Ameen. listening and, and, and watching this podcast. Barakallah fikum wa jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Halab al-khamis. 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 Halab al
هلا بالخميس هلا بالخميس هلا 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 ه